See, you know why, Krishnan? You're my family. And I always think that Ilana's for me. I am so honored and pleased that Laluri Krishnan is amongst us. And he is coming from generations of musicians. And I cannot even ask him the question, how it has impacted you. It is just in the genes. And he may have a totally different perspective to tell me about it. And Ritya, of course, she's an accomplished dancer, but also she's coming from a great tradition of the Natuanars, that is Sri Rajaratnam Pillai. And she is the only one, or the youngest, or the youngest one, to be not only a dancer, a choreographer, and also she's known as a dance activist at the moment. Never mind, she'll speak about it. Can I, uh, can you please express yourself how art is impacted? I think we can sit and talk. Why don't you sit down? Good morning to everyone. I'd like to believe that I am an inheritor of Shingara, because I come from a family that is seeped into the arts, into Bharatanatyam. And for us, dance is a hereditary right. So this idea that I am the inheritor of Shingara, or everything erotic and love, beautiful and lovely, makes my life much more enjoyable. And I think that in itself is the role of art. It makes your life more beautiful. And at times of sorrow, when you don't have something to lie back onto, an artist has something to go back to, something to work on. And in the process, it makes everything around you more beautiful. And this in itself for me is the beauty of art. And I'm very lucky that it comes through my family. As for the cognitive effects of art, I think you can see the difference in children who are trained in the arts from a young age. In fact, I had several issues as a child. I used to be slightly dyslexic. I always remember writing my uh, letters in the opposite direction. But, and even during my uh, kindergarten in, in the US, uh, I was told that I couldn't skip. So I had small, small problems as a child. But now, when I think about it, I think it is Bharatanatyam, it is art that has made me what I am now. So I speak, I write uh, about the arts, uh, I perform, and think, to think about it, dance is just not about dancing at the moment. It is about a lot of things, uh, about uh, tapping your feet in rhythm, to express on your face. So it's, it's multiple things at the same time. And this in itself, I think, is the effect of art for me. Uh, a child who had a lot of problems, now this is what it has made me into. Thank you, Nitya. But do you think that uh, in dance, we do the left and right concept uh, very well from the age of four. And I think uh, the left and right is usually a confusing thing for kids. But when you are dancing from the age of four, you think that has any impact? Definitely, definitely. Because you know, um, uh, uh, you do the same thing on right and yes. left. Yes. And to repeat it. Yeah. So I, I think that gives a great effect on your mind. It makes it very clear, yes. that kind of clarity that it gives. Yeah. Cognitive is again a thought process, you know, the, the way you discipline your mind. And then what art does to you is different to different people. And then I feel that, uh, you know, sometimes people ask me, what are you doing in living skill program or as a coach or a counselor when you should be dancing on the stage? I would always tell them that this is, the dance has touched my deeper consciousness. And I feel my consciousness has got that energy. And that energy is something that I would like to impart to others. So I'm sure my neurologist uh, friend will have something more interesting to add. Please come.
Good morning to all of you. And I was a little bewildered in earlier that there weren't too many scientists around. But after the Mangalyan group had been there, they are more and more scientific than even we as doctors. And I'm really delighted to be here this morning. And I thank all of you for the opportunity to be part of this. And I congratulate each and every one who put this meeting together because I think it wouldn't have been easy. It just wouldn't have been. You know, on April 16, 2014, the UNICEF had a meeting of people saying building better brains. And they put out three messages. One is they said that genes may be okay, but the relationship between genes and environment is tremendous. The second message is the brain is complex. It's not a homogeneous organ. It is heterogeneous. It interacts with so many parts of the body as well as the mind. And it interacts together with, uh, it sort of forms an integrated uh, output. And the third point they put out was that if there are anything wrong, like a mind dyslexia, whatever, early intervention is the answer. Because once things get worse, it's very difficult. And to us as neurologists, art is something you appreciate through some of your senses. So we have visual arts, that's the way we look at it. Visual arts, music, enjoying gourmet food is also an art. Enjoying good food, tasty food, being able to discriminate because your taste is your artistic appreciation. And humans, we know, have been creating pictures from the Stone Age time. Stone Age art that we see in caves, etc. So when we look at a picture, it does something to our brain. So what does it do to our brain? It expresses emotions. And these stories, you're able to tell stories through drawings and through art. And the experience of looking at art or looking at something, a picture or a drawing, actually refreshes, relaxes, and opens up the brain to newer experiences. And art is a product of human creativity. So we, the topic today is the impact of art on human cognition and creativity on human cognition. Now, for human cognition, we need to look at creativity from two points of view. One is originality, and the second is effectiveness. So there's no point in having a creative idea if it's not going to work in the situation where you need to apply the idea. So this originality and uh, effectiveness is actually processed in the brain through three networks. One network is called the central executive network, which actually tells you very linear thinking, tells you, OK, you have to do it logically, logistically, which actually is useless for creativity. What you need in creativity is the originality. You need different, you have to think out of the box, something, you know, bring in a new angle to it. And that is taken care of by a network, interestingly enough, which is called the default network. But would you say, doctor, that uh, if people are born with this creativity or it can be created? No, let me just I mean, explain this first. It's called the default network. What it's trying to tell you is what she's just asked as a question. Is your born creative? It's by default, you have it. You have the creative ability in you through the default network. When the default network is active is when you're daydreaming, when you're imagining, when you're you know, abstracting concepts. All of this, your default network is working. Executive network works when you bring consciousness to it and start analyzing and breaking it up into bits and pieces. But for us to, for art to impact us, you need both. You need both the networks. And there is a network called the salience network, which pulls these two together. So I know that sounds a bit scientific and I don't want any of you switching off because of that. So there's a complex interplay between the executive central logistic mind and the creative default network. Actually, creativity is intelligence having fun. As Albert Einstein, it's not my original quote, it's Albert Einstein who said that. And I think that sums it up very beautifully. 
Uh, one of the areas where a lot of application of art happens in medicine. In my own life, I'm, I used to draw, paint, sing, play the guitar, play the piano, etc. So I feel that if I excel as a doctor in the executive control area, in the linear thinking, in the left hemisphere, academic way of looking at things, it's because of all those other things which made me brilliant in this. But one of the things we are using in therapy, in neurology, is we teach patients to switch off the left hemisphere. Don't analyze. Don't say, what is it? And you'll find that your creative abilities emerge much better. So when somebody teaches you dance or teaches you music, don't say, how or why will this become this? Just do it. And that is the best way, I think, all of them who are artists here will agree for to you to learn any art, whether it's dance or music or whatever. The second area where this is very important for art and cognition is in today's schools. We have very little place for art. Padma Seshadri is a different kind of school, so it works better. It's purely left brain academic work. What you need is to bring in the right brain functions. Right brain concepts are like daydreaming, colors, three dimension, rhythm, imagination, visualization. All of these are right brain functions which you need to bring in if you want to have smart children. Because when you look at gifted children, you find there are some who are globally capable of everything and immense creativity. Then you have those who are specialized uh, knowledge in some subjects and with or without creativity. The last but not least is a child which has global skills, but is not very creative. So we need to look at all these children from the time of school readiness itself. If we want to have smart adults, you have to have smart kids. And smart kids are possible when you use art and creativity to impact human cognition. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Vincent. No, no, it's absolutely fascinating. Can now, I'll I, I, uh, uh, okay. read on. You can speak. Can you uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you, Lakshmi. I think she's here for uh, following up and uh, getting this whole beautiful program organized. And um, a couple of things I'm very proud about today is uh, I come from this beautiful company called Pfizer. Pfizer saves millions of people across the world. And uh, I head culture change and diversity for uh, Pfizer India. I work for the manufacturing unit of Pfizer. That's one thing that makes me very proud, but uh, because I'm directly in the job of saving lives. The second thing I'm proud of is I'm in the same stage as uh, Dr. YGP, because I'm a proud alumni of PSDB. And so is my son, Anirudh. So uh, many things I'm proud about, and thanks for this forum, this opportunity. When I saw the, um, my co-panelists, and especially Dr. Pritika Chari there, um, I was wondering, and uh, you know, we are the only two people who are not in direct art forms, you know, like the other panelists. Uh, so I was thinking I should uh, speak something very different. And I have Dr. Pritika who's sitting there and saying, you know, I'm there, we stuff like that. So I kind of made some notes, but then um, when I came here, there was a story that struck my mind. So I come from a very, I'm married into a family of uh, musicians. So my mother-in-law is Sandram Krishnan. She's an A-grade artist in the AIR and she's uh, 86 years old, young, a young lady. And um, my, my husband keeps telling me, my husband is a musician too. He has his own recording studio. Uh, very passionate musicians I'm married into. Um, and uh, my mother-in-law sings at the age of 86 and uh, she, she also produces a lot of, you know, music uh, very regularly and my husband produces that for her. So when I was making some notes, you know, my husband keeps telling, like, you know, P. Sushila and my mother are of the same age, but my mother has never lost her voice. Whereas P. Sushila is actually, she's kind of lost her voice. Because I feel, you know, the couple of things that, that I made notes and what I see as a comparison with my mother-in-law, Sandram Krishnan, uh, Srimati Sandram Krishnan, is 
Artists are highly disciplined in what they do. My mother-in-law at the age of 86 does sadhagam at five o'clock in the morning. In fact, she wakes me up every day. I lived with them with my in-laws for the last 25 years. I'm married for 25 years and I live with them for the last 25 years. And I wake up to the, to the cis sound of music, you know, and I have no clue of Carnatic music. So Mr. J. G. J. R. Krishnan, I, I have no clue of any Carnatic music, but she wakes me up. So disciplined. And I also, when I was reading some things about artists, I was told that these people are highly adaptable and flexible. These are all the executive functions that Dr. Prithika was talking about. The higher mental functions, the higher executive functions that we people in the corporates are supposed to be doing every day. Decision making, problem solving, adaptability, flexibility. These are some things that we are supposed to have as a second nature in our jobs. But I see all of this in my mother-in-law and she's never worked in a corporate. She's been a very um, you know, limited housewife. Uh, she's 86, married for 67 years, and she was 17 or 18 when she was married. And um, she's doing all of this so beautifully. And I feel that she can pro solve problems very effectively. And Ella Manakanaka, you know, she, she can say how much we have to give the palkaran, how much we have to give the pukari, everything at her fingertips. Nothing, nothing. You know, if such a sound mental function of memory. She's an artist. She sings every day. She's dedicated her life to Carnatic music in the last uh, 70 years or so. And uh, memory is fantastic. Problem solving is unique. And if I tell her, Amma, today we will not make Parupa uh, Korba, we will make something else. Yeah, okay. No problem. I can eat anything. She says, flexibility, adaptability comes as a, as a very naturally to her. And, and, and the ability to be very original. You ask her for an idea. I've taken my mother as a case study because I know Dr. Prithika Chari will have a different case you know, <laughs> to talk about. So I thought I'd talk about her because everything comes so naturally. Decision making, yes or no, very clearly she can say. So these are the executive functions that are very prominent in the artists and people who pursue creativity as a profession or as a hobby or whatever it may be. So that's the beauty of uh, this uh, particular set of people that we are here. Um, and um, the other important thing is, you know, they, they are these people uh, who are great planners and executors which is supposed to be another second nature for people like us in the corporate. We are always measured for our planning, our execution, and so on and so forth. So I can see people in, in art and art forms, and even people who are artists in my own uh, corporate roles that I see, these are people who are able to plan meticulously and execute flawlessly. You know, these are the two important and very beautiful uh, characteristics and attributes of these uh, uh, people. And uh, these are the main things that I kind of put together to speak to you. And uh, executive functions are best. They may not be measured for their executive function. Again, measurement is an important thing for we corporate people. You know, we always use metrics, you know, uh, how many, what's the percentage of performance, things like that. And that's the way we are also paid on our appraisals, okay, at the year end. So, um, so these are people who are not measured on these executive functions, uh, but decision making or problem solving or flexibility, adaptability, memory, thinking, uh, creativity, it's all there and it is blended with their creation. It's blended with their art form. And that's what I have to tell you today. And thank you very much uh, to the forum for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much. And I think you captured everything and made us all feel so on top of the world. <laughs> because all artists who are present here, I'm sure that they think, oh my God, I can relate to this. Oh, I can relate to this. I can relate to this. And I'm sure art definitely has a great impact. It creates uh, discipline, no doubt. 
because unless there is discipline, you'll never achieve what you need to achieve. And as you said, yeah, we don't get paid for our creativity because it's natural and you're born with that energy. And it's how you make use of that energy. That's what makes you an artist. Okay, I want uh, my dear Sri Devi Umi to speak to us about her impact, please. Please. Good morning, everybody. As many, two of them are doctors, what the doctors, what they have told about the artists, we are very disciplined people. And I'm a teacher in Mohiniyatam, and as a teacher and a performer, I'm very, much, very well disciplined and very time conscious. So Lakshmi has told me, you have to speak only for four minutes. And tomorrow I have a bigger time to speak whatever I really want to come out. No? But today I have really prepared the speech for me, which I wanted to because I may exceed uh, the time. Because I have a habit of exceeding the time I start not my speech. So I just want to thank you all and WEF for this beautiful opportunity to address this august gathering of women who have proven their might across various domains, ranging from business and professional careers, specialists who have excelled in their chosen field, and leaders who provide infectious inspiration and motivation to several others, what we have been seeing now since morning. It's an honor to present to you a glimpse of my journey, which has been all about a rhythmic dimension of life. So human being with a big, human life starts with heartbeat and repeated beats that occur in a pattern for a rhythm. As a child, I remember having a de developed a sense of rhythm and I started tapping my feet on the same right from the time I can remember. I was always a dancer when I was a child. I used to walk with a dancing step. So the freedom and the innocence of childhood, childhood enabled me to in immerse myself in the rhythmic aspect, having no worry, without having, without having to worry about the nuances of specific dance forms it belonged to. Initially, I recall that it probably was a kind of uh, oriental dancing. There was no specific dance style like Bharatanatyam available in Calicut, Kerala, because I'm speaking about 50 years back. Because I'm a very senior citizen, proudly say, I'm, I'm just going to complete my 73 years. I'm still dance performing with the younger girls. All my students are from IT, IT field, so young ladies. And I just give them counseling. I know them how to, how to cope up with the life. How to cope up with the rhythm and the music, everything, you know, to balance the life because they are all undergoing a lot of stress. So my classes are only the weekends. Only the weekends they want to just come and let out their whatever the stress being accumulated by the past one week of their heavy work. So dance is a the very big therapeutic, uh, th therapeutic effect the dance has got. So, Vasanta will readily agree with me because we are all from that, you know, we have the same school of thought. So, while it is, uh, see, it's a girl, me, while it is every girl's dream to be seen as a beautiful and graceful, the, the reality is that swift and often drastic changes occur in the life of a girl child as she transitions from a daughter 
to a sibling, a wife, a daughter-in-law, sister-in-law, to a mother and a grandmother. While boys do go through the similar transitions, clearly defined roles and responsibility help them cope with such changes. So back then, women was the pillar of the home and was one who ensured that everything worked well for everybody. The success of a woman also translated to the success of every, each family members. So her immense love along with awareness for her duties and responsibilities would often change the rhythm of their lives. See, sometimes life will, will give you a lot of off, off rhythm situation. I also have gone through that. I have lost my very young artist daughter, Monisha. She was an actress. She was the president awardee for the best actress. She was just 14 when she acted, studying in Bishop Cotton College School in uh, uh, Bangalore and uh, did a lot of South Indian films and good a good Bharatanatyam and Mohiniyatam dancer as a brilliant student. So that was a jolt I got when I was just 47. So from there, this is the work I've been doing and uh, I don't know how to explain. Many, many, many things are coming in my mind to talk to you, but of course I will do it tomorrow. But the dance has really brought me up to the world. And I have to say this, just now I remembered about the people whom I come across during our disaster time. Meeting people and the meeting right people in the right time is a, a big blessing. I have to say Mrs. Uh, uh, Dr. Acharya, Dr. Aram Verma, who was a neurologist, he was a neurosurgeon from Nimhans, Bangalore, those days. She is my, he is my living God. He used to call me and come to, to my uh, house to visit me every day afternoon, taking a gap from the hospital, asking my son, such as hijack me. So my son used to go, with all the raised, you know, the dark glasses in the thing, he goes behind the hospital, he comes. That is kind of service. It's a, it's a blessing I got. It's a service he has done because I was totally out. I was bedridden in the accident. So that's the time he was talking about all the side, of right side brain and left side brain. He was coaching me with a lot of life. He called the whole thing that he was telling me completely he put me on board through this. I was so touched when he told me I wanted to listen to her so much. So this is the thing. And uh, so life go on and on. So life, it's just, it's, if it was, a, it was a stage, then it is ruled by time and rhythm. And as I briefly touched upon, time can change the rhythm anytime. We just need to dance along. Yes. I think that's the point. Our only need to ensure is that there should never be a missing beat. Yes. Then that can derail us, derail our lives. There is no point staying aloof from life when situations and incidents don't work well for us. We are all here to obey the greater purpose, which is complete, which, which is to be completed, the rhythm of life, or rather the rhythmic dimension of life gracefully. Thank you very much, especially Lakshmi and all the WEF for me to give me a chance to come and speak this in. Tomorrow I'll be talking for a longer period where I had to share a lot of things. Thank you so my much. Effort. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vasanta. Thank you so much, Eti. I always uh, call you Eti. And uh, 
uh, you know, like we have seen that uh, how art in different forms affects different people and makes an impact and a deeper. Uh, the, the best point here is the positive impact. It has never made a negative impact on anyone. So I think uh, uh, if you have the, it's, it's also, you know, people say that uh, man cannot create anything that's not there. Man can only create what is already existing. So that means the creativity is an energy that you just bring it out for your own positive living and make it your living skill and pattern. I'll ask Veena, please come. Yeah, sure. Because the moment I stand there, I'll forget what I have to speak. <laughs> Veena, come on, you are. Oh my I'm God. My brain will stop working there. So it's better here. I am Veena Krishnan. I'm basically an artist. I paint, but I'm not a learned artist. I used to draw when I was a child and I got married to an army officer. So I had a lot of time in my life and there I decided I should do something with the time which I have got. I had a neighbor who was an artist from JJ School of College from Mumbai. So I've asked, requested her to teach me painting. So she said, I cannot teach you painting. Painting has to come from inside. You can see me painting. I'll give you time for that. That's how I started painting. Then I used to copy Raja Ravi Verma's paintings. That is how I used to almost five to six years I did that. After doing that, I realized I need to create something from my own, like what is there inside. But then I realized I started making squares and circles with colors. And I, somebody, the people who have seen my paintings with geometric figures, they started uh, comparing with Raza's painting. So then I, I was a little afraid to, oh, nobody should say it's a copied art. So, but then my, my attachment towards the tantric system, I really wanted to learn tantric paintings. So I contacted a friend of mine, his Dr. Emma Malex, who's no more with us. He said, I worked with him for almost three years. It's the most, most blessed hours in my life because he taught me the connection with art and brain. He was doing research on music and its impact on brain and how to prevent dementia through art forms. That is how I started going into more into art and the power of colors. Because we know enough, or any one of us cannot uh, imagine a color, a, a world without color, a gray world, a pink world. No, we need colors around us. And every color comes with an emotion. It can be sorrow, it can be happiness, and even we call, we may say, have you seen that person today? No, I don't remember. No, the person was in red sari. So anything which we see, this is a color which is going to impact us initially. And that, where, that is where I thought it sh I should take this seriously. So when it comes to tantric painting, then he told me, okay, tantra, tantri, tantra, or tantra means nothing but distillation. Distillation of your own brain, making your brain, brain so powerful it becomes a receiver of signals around you. And that is how I started on a subject which, you know, today had been started talking in the morning, Durga and her weapons. And now I'm in a project of making 64 yoginis, that is the, the uh, goddesses which you have to cross to reach Durga or the ultimate power. He used to tell a man chromosome is made of it's X and Y, and the woman is X and X. So I, the, there is a woman in every man, and woman is completed by herself. So to reach the power, that is the 64 yoginis is basically 64 energy point in your social sharira. So I went in search of that, but again, it is there is nothing on the net, there is nothing on uh, reading, very less of information available. So then. I believed in what Dr. Alex tried his level best to teach me. It is open up your brains, receive the signals. Now I have already completed 11 painting of mine, which is not available online, which is again the 64 yoginis, the power of a feminine. And he used to tell me, you need to write it down because then it's how you need to express. Sometimes every time it is not possible, somebody will understand a painting 
or you need to express it through writing. Writing was impossible for me because I'm a very poor reader. They always say people who read a lot and read can write. But no, again, I really believed in that uh, power as a woman, or sorry, a brain can conceive. So then I started writing. It is unbelievable when I sit to write. I am able to write. I believe that it is, there's no left and right brain. It is the left, right brain, they say it is creative. But to implement, you need the left brain to be logic. So that is where I feel the art in my life has created uh, ripples around me. And uh, I, I'm able to do a lot of two things, I feel, because I spend a lot of my time uh, in painting. I get up at three o'clock, I paint four to five hours almost every day, and I don't sleep during the day. I feel that six hours of painting is much more calming my brain than six hours of my sleep. So I feel, and I'm now I've got a, from Ministry of um, uh, Culture, I'm doing a fellowship on the impact of art and um, on brain. So that I'm already finished my third semester. I'm on the final semester, but I'm there, I'm doing not only um, uh, painting, it is more on Nati Shastra, how it can develop cranial brains, how it can uh, stop dementia, prevent dementia. In fact, because movement of your cranial nerves how to control, keep your five senses active, because I'm no more, I am no uh, educated in talking in front of doctors to talk about neurology, but I am trying to learn the science behind the colors and the brain. And I really thank you all for giving me an opportunity to speak and express this in front of you. And I'm waiting to complete my 64 yoginis to present in front of all of you. Thank you so much, Dino. That was very interesting. And I think uh, here there is one small note that, uh, you know, I must say when you said that uh, having all the senses together, working together, this happened to us, this happened to me when I was performing in the Gulf, the ones in Muscat, and we had some Arab audience in the audience. So my opinion was at that time, you know, you do get these opinion, your own opinions you form. So I thought, you know, they are not going to understand, but never mind, they have come to see the dance, so that's fine. But actually, end of the dance, the only, the Arab, one particular Arab, I cannot name, I cannot give you his name, but he was the only one who came up to the stage and said, this is not a normal art. This needs a control of your senses, and this needs your body, mind, and there is a lot of mathematics here. And he says, to have this mathematics, you have to have discipline. So this, this thought came to me when you yeah, because spoke this, about yeah, that. When you call about intuition, yes. gut, I think that all works a major part of the brain. Yes. But then it is to accept it, to put it down into the canvas. It is, I feel that my, you know, left brain activating started. it, basically. It's activating it. Yeah. Actually, she has embodied what I said about yes. the executive network and the default yes. network. So you do the art and then you have to make it work. Right. And in Alzheimer's patients, there are two types of dementia we have called frontotemporal and Alzheimer's. In frontotemporal patients, they've done these studies and they found when the right side of the brain, I mean left side of the brain is knocked off, a person who's never painted, never danced or sung can suddenly develop creativity. Yeah. And this is used in therapy in Alzheimer's patients. Mm -hmm. So you're actually doing something which is scientifically very accepted. And in fact, I should thank mm -hmm. Dr. M.M. Alexis, not more, no more with us, has put the seed in me and given me the inner strength to take it forward, the learning. I'll be happy to exactly. Thank you so much. <laughs> now please, uh, uh, Sri Lalbudi Krishna, the violent maestro of uh, our times. And coming from a very, very accomplished, please give him a big hand because he is deserving and he's coming from a very accomplished uh, family. His father was gifted a violin by Yahudi Menuhin. I remember that that day. And I was a little girl. And then, you know, he came to our house and showed us the violin. He says, Here is a violin maestro, a living legend in India, and he is his son. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction. A violinist in a chromatic context dons the role of 
accompanist and also a soloist. When he accompanies, this situation is very similar. The vocalist would have exhausted all the all that is possible, and the violinist should carefully choose those areas which were left untouched. I'm in a similar situation here, <laughs> and uh, so I should concentrate on some of the some of the points which were not touched. An artist, especially musician, must be endowed with a sense of humor because timing is both important in humor and in music. So I, I thought I can commence with a sense of humor. All we know is about much was spoke, spoken about left brain and the right brain. All I know was in the left, nothing is right, and in the right, nothing is left. <laughs> uh, for a violinist, the music is even more abstract because it's purely instrumental. And I have something more common. I'm also a PSBB alumni as Mrs. Sriram. And oh, okay, I do. So academics become very easy when you choose art. The world itself seems totally different. I should be quoting my guru and father. I'm so blessed to have had a guru in my father. I am doubly blessed to have seen more of the guru than of the father, because initially it seems very restrictive. But at a later point of time, you realize that those fetters are to unfetter you for the world of bliss, unlimited bliss and freedom. When a musician learns, first he repeats whatever that is embedded in our culture, a guru should be implicitly obeyed. And that's the best way to learn an art. Like a liar bird, you are just repeating whatever is taught. Then the process of internalizing takes place. Then you draw inspiration, you draw energy from what you have internalized, and you start creating. Like the green car, you draw the energy from the music, and you have to be different. But you cannot trespass into an alien territory, making your own music, which has been so traditional, sound something alien. So it's a very balancing act one has to develop. We have this improvisational aspect in Carnatic music. It is like taking many on-the-spot decisions, which IAMs teach you, crisis management. It is also based on scientific knowledge and also the intuitive ability in you. I should quote my guru, who used to say that, looking at a column, he will say that the dots or the lamb and the curves that go around it are the melody. So the whole world will seem totally different. You draw inspiration from nature. And the best thing that can happen to a musician is when you first you hear the notes, the same notes will convey more. And finally, when you, when you can see the notes, when a wave or a mountain or a river, it can 
prompt you a note or a raga, that is when creativity will be at its best. We get trained in so many ways. You get sensitized, you get sensitive and sensitized as you progress and as you learn. And you also need to be insensitive to the happenings around you. I can cite the example of performing in a wedding concert where the decibel level will be to the maximum, but the moment you pick up the bow, you should learn to disconnect from the what is happening around you. In music, the notes are as important as the silence between the notes. Even in such noise, you should be sensitive enough to draw inspiration from the silence between the notes. So you have to be extremely sensitive and at the same time insensitive. In Tamil, we have the Yam Petra Inbam Vayaham. That is whatever joy you derive, you are able to share it with the listeners. There is no duality, total Advaitam, when you immerse yourself in the music. That is a greatest blessing, being a musician. You are in it, but you can be outside. You can have the macro view of where you are traveling, but each note is magnified. The brain process it all. First, a musician hears the note, later the notes convey more, or fewer notes convey more. And I just want to end quoting my father's composition. When you explain something, it becomes more meaningful. And I am really blessed to have had such a great guru. He has composed many tillanas and varnams, which are all popular in the Varsanatyam genre also. I would like to quote the Madhuvanti Tillana of his. How? I, I just mentioned that you have to see the notes. A typical example I will give and then wind up before the bell, bell rings. The, 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 in Madhuvanti, his Pallari, the last phrase so mathematically we have threes, five sets of threes in this. And you know the notes. Ni ma da ga ma. It's very aesthetically so attractive. And we are, it is mesmerizing, I should say. So what is beyond that? So when you go and ask the composer, what did you visualize when you composed this? Out comes the reply. He says, it, I'm just depicting the fall season when a leaf falls. Before the final fall, if you realize, it climbs up before it falls like that. You can, if you move the hands according to the notes, you can literally see the leaf. This is the reverse. Before it falls, it rises up. So we, the whole world without music and arts will be totally 
different and I am indeed really, be, really blessed to have been an artist in this birth and every birth I would like, love to be a violinist. Thank you very much. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you. Thank you everyone for this uh, beautiful panel discussion. I really enjoyed it because we all had different perspectives to tell, but we all arrive at the same goal, saying that uh, art, the world cannot exist without art. As Christian said, there's no music, there's no dance, there's no colors, there's no life. Thank you. Thank you so much. That session, that's what I was saying, that wasn't a session, it was more like an experience, like going on a journey of art and culture. Thank you so much for that beauty, adding so much beauty to our afternoon. With that, we'd like to initiate the award ceremony. I'd like to also invite, along with Dr. Harbina Rora, Sakina Ansari, a sister, who, a sister from Chennai Integral. In the making of this forum, please come to the front. I'd like to invite Nridhya Pillai to accept her award as an exceptional woman of excellence. This afternoon, we congratulate you, Nridhya. Coming upon Dr. Kritika Chari, a woman of the decade in healthcare. I am like Sri Devi Oni to accept this honor as an exceptional woman of excellence.